Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tony Bergantino. I'm the director of the Wyoming State Climate Office and the Water Resources Data System. Uh, before getting started today, I took a look back and I'm pleased to report that this is the 20th uh, Conditions and Outlooks webinar that we've given. So I'm glad that you're all able to join us today. The webinar is being uh, presented by my office, along with the U.S. Geological Survey, the Bureau of Reclamation, the National Weather Service in Cheyenne, and the USDA Northern Plains Climate Hub and University of Wyoming Extension. And today we'll be looking at uh, current drought conditions, reservoir operations, uh, surface water conditions, uh, and then we'll have a look forward with some uh, forecasts and outlook. So jumping into current conditions, we'll start her off with the current uh, US Drought Monitor map. This was just released this morning and gives the status of uh, drought as of uh, the 25th or Tuesday. These areas in red deteriorated since our last webinar and uh, quite a few little areas of green that saw some improvement resulting from the, mostly from the recent snows. And most of these degradations have taken place uh, in the east and southeast. Uh, you know, they're areas that missed out on a lot of the precip this month. Uh, my own station, uh, Kokora station only saw uh, it was less than a, a tenth of an inch over uh, since the beginning of the month. This is the 14-day total precipitation statewide as a percentile. Uh, northwest, uh, as well as you know, central, north central Wyoming have been at uh, median or above precipitation. Uh, some of the south central as well, but you can see a lot of dryness persisting in the southeast and a little bit in the upper, actually more than a little bit up in the upper upper green basin. Moving on, this is the, the exact same type of map. It is the 90-day uh, precipitation. Uh, at 90 days, much of the state is at or above the median, although the east and southeast are standing out uh, those deficit conditions again, uh, going back at least three months, although it doesn't look as bad when you're, when you're considering it over that longer time frame. This is the Standardized Precipitation Evapotranspiration Index, or affectionately known as the SPEI. And it's a bit more involved than a, a regular precipitation map. It's an index calculated from precip and evapotranspiration data. It gives a lot better idea of the water balance compared to just looking at precipitation. And since you're looking at an index, you don't have actual precipitation amounts, but you have index values, which go from a negative two on the dry side to up over plus two on the wet side. And those values are, there's a, a bit of calculation involved, but those values are, they represent the number of standard deviations away from the median that the conditions in a given area are. And those are calculated over uh, sort of a grid over the state. And that's what you're seeing in these maps. And these show 30, 60, and down here in the, the lower right, uh, one year time frame, And we're seeing areas of concern persisting in the 30 days in much of the west and especially the eastern areas. And you can see those eastern areas are going back, they're showing up on the maps going all the way back a year. So really, really getting, uh, staying dry over in, in those parts of the state, especially. This is the 14 day average minimum temperature. I'll start down here on the lower, on the lower left. This is the departure from normal. And you can see generally within plus or minus three degrees of average, except for some of these orange areas, uh, especially in the Powder Tongue, Fremont County, up in the park a little, and then down here in the, in the southeast a little bit that are up to up to six degrees above average over the last two weeks. Uh, looking at the actual temperatures, we're seeing that the nighttime lows are starting to drop below freezing, uh, especially, especially up in the, the upper green here and these blues that you're seeing. And a few other, few other areas uh, scattered out throughout the state, even in the lower elevations that are uh, touching down below freezing at night. Uh, powder Tongue, upper parts of the, or the Bighorn by the border, Fremont County, and then the Southeast again, are staying just a little bit above freezing at night. Going on to maximum temperature, we'll start down here in the lower left again with the departure from normal. Uh, again, this is the average maximum temperature over the three-week period. Uh, we're seeing three, a little bit, I mean, a few areas up uh, above six degrees above uh, average up here in the northwest uh, and down here into the western part of the state. Uh, a few scattered pockets down here in uh, Sweetwater County, Laramie County, and then up in uh, 
uh, Johnson and, and Sheridan counties. But by and large, the remainder of the street state has been at about three degrees or so, up to three degrees or so above average. And looking at the actual temperatures up here on the upper right, uh, upper 50s uh, and above in the lower elevations and a few of these areas, uh, Central Fremont County, the Bighorn Basin, and then in the east and southeast are seeing uh, maximum temperatures over the, the last two weeks in the 60s and, and above. Yeah, this shows the difference in the last two weeks of how soil moisture is done. Not much has changed in the last two weeks. A uh, few improvements in the west and northwest. And you can see that continued deficit there in the, in the east and southeast where this, this whole swath here is running below the 10th percentile and quite a few bit of area here in Goshen Platte, uh, Converse and such are in the uh, less than second percentile, which is, is getting pretty darn dry. A look at a bit more at soils, we'll switch over to the temperature portion of that. Uh, here are temperatures at various depths at some of the uh, some of the stations from the Upper Missouri River Basin Project, as well as the State Engineer's Office, where they have uh, integrated depth soil moisture probes in, installed. Uh, this is as of seven o'clock this morning, and you might be able to see, I don't know if you can read the, the temperatures on here, but you can see some of these upper layers of the poker chips are, uh, especially here, 25 degrees, 26 degrees, uh, obviously warming as you go down into, into deeper depths. And speaking of uh, those depths, uh, let's take a look at the frost depths. This again was at seven o'clock this morning. And this is showing the frost depth around the state at stations where we can, can measure that. Uh, in some places we're seeing sub-freezing temperatures already down to uh, as much as four inches. And these are typically warming up during the day, thawing completely by the time you know, we get to the midpoint of the day, but then freezing again once we get down to night. Uh, but we're definitely moving into that uh, frozen ground part of the year. In drought timeline is showing again the percentage of uh, Wyoming in each category of drought from 2000 to present. Uh, we've now had some part of Wyoming that has been in D3 or, or the extreme drought for the last 119 weeks. Uh, the area of state in uh, D1 to D4, that's the actual drought conditions. D0 is just a, uh, a heads up warning, abnormally dry type of condition, but D1 through D4 are actually classified as drought conditions. Uh, but that has decreased since the last webinar, but only by about 0.3%. It's at 53 point, just a little over 53 and a half percent now. And I think it was 53.81 during the last webinar. Uh, Again, given the given the size of Wyoming, you might want to look at this for your own particular area. So we do have these also by each county, and those can be viewed at the, the pearl down here on the lower left. And then we'll just zoom in again to, to show what things have been since uh, the beginning of 2000 or the uh, the year in which this this current drought started. Uh, three, a little over three and a half percent of the state is in extreme drought now. And unfortunately, this is up from our webinar that was in the, the middle of September when that percentage, I think, was 1.59 percent. So we've had a, a bit of an increase in the amount of area in, in the extreme drought. The part of the state that has no D category whatsoever and not even abnormally dry is now at 14 percent, which is just up a little bit from the last one. We had our first measurable snow in Laramie this morning, a grand total of a tenth of an inch, but still something that could be measured. So we'll take a look at uh, what's, what snow is doing. Uh, after some falls and melts, it looks like we're starting to build up the snowpack this season. Higher elevations are looking to be at or even above a median in, in a few places. But uh, while we're getting numbers on the map, it's very early in the season, as you all know. And so you'll notice that every basin has an asterisk next to its uh, percentage. Uh, and that just means that the numbers, you can, you can calculate a percentage, but it may or may not, uh, usually may not, be entirely representative of conditions on the ground at the time. So once these numbers become a bit more representative, the, the color coding that you see here on the, on the right side will kick in and... and the basins will start to become color coded, but just for emphasis, I decided not to color these things in until we get some actual solid numbers showing up there. Uh, and this is snowpack uh, by basin. Um, this is showing the building of the snowpack in the Wind River Basin. Uh, this year is in the dark little line here, circled in red. 
uh, last year's is the gray line. Uh, the maximum uh, maximum ever seen is the blue line. The minimum is the red, and then median is this is this green line here. And we have these charts updated daily, and they can be seen for all 22 basins that were shown on that previous map. And they can all be found at the the link down here on the on the lower left part of the page. Now, this is a new product that we're producing. It was experimental towards the end of last season and went operational with the start of water year 2023. And what this does is shows the total water volume of snow. Um, this one is the Snake River Basin and shows what at, this one's showing all elevations. Uh, the dark line circled is this year. And again, blue, max, red, uh, minimum. The dark green is the, the median. And then there's a lighter, grayish green line here that you might not be able to see too well, and that's the average uh, value. But as you can see, we just sort of kicked up above the median and average here uh, just a week or so ago. And like the like the previous charts, these are updated daily and are at the link that's down here on the, on the lower left uh, part of the slide. And in case you don't get those down, this will be made available in the uh, uh, you'll be able to view it in either the the, the video or the PowerPoint uh, PDF afterwards. And take this a little bit further. These charts show a bit more honed in and show the volume at each elevation slice and what that's contributing. I'm only showing three here, uh, but each basin is sliced, so to speak, into nine elevation ranges. And then uh, these charts are created for each one showing the volumetric water content at each of those elevation ranges. Uh, this is the Snake River Basin again and shows the three main contributing elevations. You can kind of see this eight to 9,000 feet uh, looks like about the one that has uh, the highest volume with uh, the shoulders on either side from nine to 10,000 or seven to 8,000. And then that drops off quite a bit as you go uh, above and below that. Uh, the numbers are starting to take, Starting to go up a little bit here. And one important thing to note is that these are uh, raw mountain numbers and they don't necessarily represent what will be seen at the gauge. They don't take into account uh, vaporization, evaporation, uh, infiltration into the ground. Uh, the next step will be taking a look at these numbers and seeing what can be done as far as uh, looking at soil conditions, uh, things like permeability, slope, temperature, wind, and, and things like that and see if we can come up with uh, some better ideas of what's actually gonna make it into the gauge and then becomes true water supply. So speaking of snowpack to the river connection, that makes a good segue to our next speaker who is Liz Cresto. Liz is with the Bureau of Reclamation and we'll talk uh, about reservoir operations. Liz? All right. Yep, I'm Liz Cresto with Bureau of Reclamation out of the Wyoming area office. Um, our office covers the area um, shaded in blue and kind of pink on the map there. Um, starting off with the North Platte system, we had another dry year on the North Platte and our reservoir system reflects that. As of the 26th, the system is 37% full or 72% of average. And you can see how that's broken down in the table below in um, terms of reservoir contents and percent of average. Next slide. So the irrigation season has ended um, for our reservoir. So we are currently in winter release mode and we anticipate these um, releases to continue for the foreseeable future. So we're releasing 530 CFS in the Miracle Mile, um, 450 CFS at Gray Reef, 25 CFS below Glendo, and then Guernsey is essentially shut off, but there is some gate leakage there, so that's about three CFS. If you want to keep up to date on our reservoir conditions and releases, check out that um, web link I provided. Let's switch to the Bighorn side of things. Um, the Bighorn system last year received um, a better water supply. We had better spring rains and kind of hit that some of that um, epic storm that hit the Yellowstone that caused so much flooding. We received some of that um, as well. And um, as a result, our reservoirs filled 
and currently our, our, um, the Bitcoin side is sitting in a little bit better shape. So the reservoir system is 75% full, which is a little above average at 111% of average. And there's the table of how it's broken down between the reservoirs. Next slide. Um, we, Bitcoin side, we're also in the winter release mode. Irrigation has ended. Buffalo Bill will be releasing 260 CFS, and that's measured at the Cody gauge um, for winter releases. That release rate is set by a winter flow agreement that's signed by various entities of the state of Wyoming and Bureau of Reclamation. So um, based on conditions uh, in the basin, it was determined that we'll be releasing 260 all winter. Full Lake releases for the winter are right around that 30 CFS. And then Poison will be releasing about 900 CFS for the winter. And again, there's that link that you can keep up to date if you're interested in reservoir contents and releases. That's all I have. Oh, and here's a last slide of uh, a link to what our, you can get all kinds of data from the Bureau of Reclamation uh, website um, there, and you can get all kinds of it plots various different ways. So that's yep. all I have. Yep. Thanks, Liz. Yep, thanks. Next up, we have Aaron Fiaschetti with the USGS, who will continue discussing surface water conditions. Aaron? Hey, Tony. Thank you. Um, so I'll just kind of start off here like we do normally with this um, map from the National Water Information Dashboard showing the gauge, real-time gauge status for today. The green is a normal condition ranging from the 25th to 75th percentile, so that's Pretty low to pretty high flow is, you know, considered to be normal. Um, and then the the oranges is below normal, below the 25th. The darker red is below the 10th. And then the bright red is an all-time low. And we have two of those today. One is Fontenelle Creek. That's got a pretty substantial period of record down there in the southeast. And then uh, Hobeck um, near Jackson, which has... Uh, a pretty short period of record. So it's not quite as meaningful as the uh, flow down in the, on Fontenelle. Uh, you know, in general, the north to north uh, west part of the states looks pretty good. Um, but as we've kind of uh, feel like I'm repeating myself each time I present, the southwest continues to be a, a little bit drier, but we've seen some improvement uh, in October. October generally, um, is a time where there's not a lot of flow volume, maybe some flow added here and there from rain or snow melt, but we're just kind of receding into winter base flows. So a time of lower stable flow as we come into uh, November here next week and on. So uh, next slide, Tony. So just kind of bouncing around the state here, uh, North Fork Shoshone at Wapiti up in the Northwest corner. Uh, flows have been looking pretty good up here at this site since uh, runoff started in uh, late May. Um, flows have been kind of trending uh, near the median or above the median uh, on this. Uh, I'll just mention real quickly on this uh, uh, hydrograph here that the, the colors are the same as what I was presenting before with the percentiles. So that green behind the is uh, 25th to 75th percentile showing that range. And what we're focused on here for 2022 is the black line. So up here on the North Fork the Shoshone, things have looked good. They continue to look good. Um, now that we're through the water year, I was able to run some provisional numbers and compare uh, what the average flow was over the water year, October 1 to September 30th first. Um, and it looks like on the North Fork, the Shoshone things came out above the median. So uh, pretty reasonable water year up there. So um, better, better than we've seen elsewhere. So uh, expect things will continue to look good there and in decline as you kind of see that hydrograph will into November and December. 
So moving on to the powder at Arvada. Um, right now, things look pretty good. You can see this uh, prairie prairie stream it has quite a bit different hydrograph from the snowmelt runoff from the mountains there on the Shoshone, north of the Shoshone. Um, flows have been increasing since uh, it kind of hit bottom there in uh, August. Um, so things have kind of come up with precipitation moving through the area and maybe other management factors there. But uh, in general, things look pretty good. It, you know, right now it looks like it's below the median. Um, so we'll kind of see what happens here if um, it gets more beneficial precip and things kind of trend up a little bit. But right now it's it's in that normal range, but uh, it, it could get below normal here um, if it doesn't pick up more moisture. And, and for the water year here at the Powder at Arvada, it, uh, it, the flows were below the median, but they were above the 25th percentile. So uh, not real low, but uh, not, not, uh, not near the central uh, tendency for this uh, river. Moving on to the North Platte at the state line here. Um, after um, here in July, things kind of ramped up to releases or stream flows brought the conditions up to the normal, um, somewhere around the median to above normal. Then we had a bit of a bump here in uh, early September, and then flows have kind of decreased into normal and then to below normal conditions as of recently. Looking at a water year summary, the average flow on the North Platte was below the 25th percentile compared to the period of record. Um, so pretty low flows on the North Platte overall at this location at the state line. And then we'll bump over to the green below uh, Fontenelle. Um, so, uh, you know, as of recently into September and October, flows have increased in the, in the river there at that location. Right now, it looks like things are above the, the median. So the flows are looking pretty, pretty good right now. I know it's pretty heavily managed system there. Um, so that could change with uh, operations. But as of right now, flow conditions look pretty good for the water year. Um, and you can see it probably pretty clearly when runoff should have occurred there in May and June, not, not a lot happened. So it's not surprising that uh, the water year average flow here at this location was below the 25th percentile. So pretty low flows on the Green River at this location for 2022. And then moving on to the Fontenelle, since it was showing a daily record low for this day today, I figured I'd present Fontenelle Creek near Fontenelle. Um, so, you know, it seems like things had chugged along you know, right around that 25th percentile for most of the year. Um, so, and, and then into, uh, through runoff and then a little bit of bump in September with some moisture, but uh, things have kind of dived down a bit lower here uh, into October into that below normal. Um, so for today, uh, the or yesterday actually, the it set a record for the day, so. Pretty low flows there, um, and as you'd expect, uh, looking at this plot of the hydrograph, this station also came in below the 25th percentile for the water year. And then just moving on to uh, reservoirs, you know, as I mentioned before, it's a time of not great water supply. So in general, there's mostly some very small decreases, one or two percent. Uh, gains or losses and storage throughout the state, but there was some larger decreases in uh, Palisades and Jackson, which continue to be quite low, and then uh, some decreases in Buffalo Bill and Fontenelle. So um, that's all I have. Thank you, Tony. Thanks, Aaron. Now moving to the, the look forward, we have Tony Anderson with the National Weather Service over in Cheyenne, and he'll talk about weather forecasts and outlooks. Take it, Tony. All righty, thank you and good afternoon, everyone. We're 
Uh, this is Tony Anderson. I'm the service hydrologist in Cheyenne. We're going to look forward over the next uh, seven days to three months and give you an idea of what uh, we're, our forecasts are showing. Uh, right now, the seven day forecast is largely less than a tenth of an inch across the state. And the there is some good news that looks like in for the Western Mountains out in the, especially in the Yellowstone Plateau. That's going to be coming in later in the week. And I do have to say the model uncertainty with the forecast of that uh, system's arrival is highly uncertain. And so the models have been tending to push it out a day or two as the, as they update. So that may end up coming later than the seven day period. However, uh, right now the forecasts are showing rain moving in um, in the Sunday, Monday timeframe in the Western part of the state, and then slowly moving across the state uh, to the East. Next slide, please. Okay, going out to the six to 10 day outlook, the temperature outlook is showing a fairly strong signal towards below normal temperatures uh, for the six to, day, six to 10 day period. It is a kind of a weak signal on the Eastern border and it strengthens to a weak, uh, what I would call a very strong signal in the Northwest corner of the state. The six to 10 day precipitation outlook is uh, very strongly above normal for most of the state and uh, just strongly above normal or showing that signal for above normal. However, uh, again, this is this is covering that window of when that storm system is going to arrive. So that above normal single signal is probably concentrated in the mountains more than it is in the plains of the state. And again, the uncertainty on that is fairly strong. Moving a little bit further out, you can see the below normal temperature signal weakens a little little bit, but it is still weak on the east and uh, strong in the west. And then on the precipitation signal, uh, that's a, uh, let's see, that's weak, that's a moderate signal uh, towards above normal precipitation for that same time period. That may actually be catching some of that uncertainty from the seven day forecast. Next slide. Okay, jumping out to the seasonal outlook. This is for pretty much the uh, November, December, January timeframe, go end of the fall going into the winter. And the temperature outlook is a, it's pretty much showing a weak well, above normal signal for the outlook. And going over to the precipitation, this is the bad news. There's really not much signal there. We got a, a weak signal up in the Northwest, up in the Yellowstone area. But for the most part, the for the outlook isn't showing, isn't really giving us a signal. We're having equal chances of normal, above normal, and below normal precipitation through the winter. And I wish, <laughs> I wish that was strongly above normal, but <laughs> they don't let me make these things. So uh, I wish I had better news. Hopefully, these will. We'll repeat the system that just rolled through. We could use those about once a week for the rest of the winter. All right, and I thanks, think Tony. that's my last slide. All right, uh, a little recap of the US drought monitor. As we saw, there was some uh, improvements and some unimprovements, uh, with most of the unimprovements being in the, in the Southeast and Eastern portion, a little bit in the central part, and then uh, down there in the southeast or southwest, another uh, degradation from D1 to D2 and uh, improvements mostly across the north down uh, side by side with some of the uh, uh, the degradation. So kind of a mixed bag over the last uh, last month. So now I want to talk a little bit about you, how you can help out and how you can uh, uh, report conditions. And we'll take a look at the first of these, which is the Seymour the Condition Monitoring Observer Report System. Uh, the Earl is highlighted on the slide there. And this system allows people to submit reports, you know, just showing what they're looking at in terms of impacts on the ground uh, in a variety of categories, such as livestock, fire, surface water, wildlife, uh, whatever you. Uh, the last batch there has some uh, 
I'm sure if there was anything that really came on here since uh, our last webinar, since we're starting to get later in the season, but uh, with one exception, they're all on the dry side. In this system, you can also uh, submit some photographs, sort of like what's uh, shown here. Uh, like the like the stress that a single photo will tell you what things look like right now, but you don't know what things should look like, or uh, you know even what they were looking like before. So, uh, it's really helpful if you can post photos from you know from the same vantage point, but from different periods, like uh, one year ago, or even you know month to month when you're if you're do set up and start to make uh, consistent reports to the system. Try to include a photo so you can see what, how things are progressing through through your little neck of the woods. One other area of uh, that can uh, that you can join to help is to be a Cocoraz observer. Uh, you can send in condition reports through this program too, and those are displayed on the map down there on the lower right. Uh, but the original intent of this network was to help get a better, very you know better handle on how varied precipitation can be over short distances. It actually started after the Fort Collins flood of, of 1997. And uh, as part of that was to get a good handle on uh, you know, what, what really fell across different parts of the city. And so there was a, a brief little project that started that's turned into a, almost a 25 year endeavor to measure precipitation over, over short distances like this. And the, the program has gone nationwide. And so if you do join, you set up a, a four inch diameter uh, gauge that will provide and submit your precipitation reports online each morning via the form that you can see here on the left. Um, one thing I would also like to point out on this is a lot of people think that they only have to report precipitation. And while that's very helpful to know what is falling, it's also very helpful to know what's not falling when you're when you're looking at terms of, of drought. So, uh, if you can, and if you do join, please remember to report your zeros as well. And this map shows on the left the observations that were made for uh, today so far. And as you can see, a fairly good distribution across the state. But what you can also see is there's a lot of a lot of empty spaces on that map. Um, and even if you look at the map on the right, which is the number of active observers in their, their locations. These are people who have made reports at least once in the last year or so. Uh, obviously, a lot more than are making reports each day. But even on that map, there's still a lot of open spaces. I mean, other than Casper, not much in Natrona. Other than Rock Springs Green River, Sweetwater County is open quite a bit. And you know, e each county has its, its, its good concentrations of the observers and its open spaces. So. It'd be really helpful if we can get some people in to fill those, um, you know, fill those spots. And that those holes are not just what you see in the Kokoraz network. Those those holes exist in all networks out there. I've shown this map before, uh, and this is observations uh, the, shows the locations from multiple networks, and these are all combined and put into the maps that you saw earlier in the webinar. And this uh, map just shows the stations that were used to create the grids on the first of this month. Uh, but again, if you look, there's, there's an extra dot there in Natrona County that we don't see in the, actually two extra dots and concentrations in Natrona County that we don't see on the Cocoa Raz, uh, but still a lot of open spaces in places like uh, Sweetwater County, Fremont County, a, lo a lot of them are, you know, there's a, there's a lot of gray on that map that'd be nice to fill in with some, some dots. And so if you do uh, want to become an observer or do know someone who might want to sign up, you can do that so at the, the URL that's on the, the lower left part of the slide, or you can contact me via the, the information that's on this last slide, which is this slide. And with that, I will conclude today's webinar. Uh, thanks again to all our presenters. Uh, their names and affiliations are shown on this slide. And on behalf of them, thanks for, thanks for joining us today. So with that, I'll turn it over to Wendy Kelly with 